from the deformation of operator algebras and the construction of quantum fields. Thank you. Yeah, algebraic quantum field theory, 50 years old uh, today, or 52 as we learned. That seems to be quite a long period for me and a special occasion to celebrate. So I'm very happy to be here and have the opportunity to speak here. Thanks a lot to the organizers for that. <coughs> as I have, of course, experienced only a short time of these 50 years, uh, really working in the field, it seems appropriate that I do not try to give some review as we had uh, yesterday, but rather talk about a subject inside algebraic quantum field theory which is, uh, which is rather new, namely uh, constructive aspects and more precisely deformations of operator algebras and the relation to the problem of constructing quantum field theories. <coughs> okay. Yeah, in many lectures today, uh, we heard uh, what algebraic quantum field theory has achieved in the past. And this is quite tremendous. I mean, <coughs> starting from some physically uh, well-motivated principle, <coughs> principles in mostly mathematically rigorous terms, it has been, uh, there has been <coughs> developed a clear framework for relativistic quantum field theory in an algebraic language. And inside this field, uh, well, people have mainly focused on the analysis of some model-independent general properties of quantum field theories. Yeah, that's what most of the work has been devoted to. And today, we have a wealth of tools and methods available for once we are given such a net, such a model, to extract the relevant physical information, for example the particle content, we can compute cross-sections and look at the charge structure, can do a short distance limit and many, many more. Yeah? So once we are given such a concrete model, we have many tools available to analyze it. Yeah? That's good. But on the other hand, the rigorous construction of such models is a difficult topic which has not been addressed that much in algebraic quantum field theory in these first 50 years but only recently, <coughs> and uh, well, this will be the topic of my talk. Yeah? I should mention that this problem of constructing uh, explicit models is not a problem of algebraic quantum field theory, but of quantum field theory in general. Yeah? Any approach experiences these difficulties in, in really rigorously defining, interacting quantum field theories, and well, the same is true here in the algebraic setting. <coughs> Yesterday, in Klaus Friedenhagen's talk, we heard uh, how, one can, how one can construct interacting theories on Minkowski space or on a curved background in a perturbative way, yeah? starting from a free theory and taking the classical Lagrangian density as an input to describe the interaction of the theory to be constructed. There is a way how to uh, define in a perturbative setting uh, interacting theories. And that works very well, but seems at the moment to be limited to uh, perturbation theory. So the convergence of this perturbation series is not under control. <coughs> um, and well, I think it's fair to say what we are really lacking today is a good quantum description of possible interactions, of possible relativistic interactions. <coughs> I mean, one can, one can view this uh, perturbative quantum field theory as follows, in my opinion. It's easy to describe a classical interaction. You just pick a Lagrangian density, but it's very difficult to turn it in a, well, consistent manner to a quantum field theory. This renormalization is the difficult part, and, well, the, uh, this may be due to the, to the problem that we choose here. Classical, classical data describe the interaction and the way to the quantum world is, in the relativistic case, very difficult. Yeah. There's one exception to this, <coughs> namely there's a certain class of models where we have a good quantum description of possible interactions. Namely, when, when thinking about interaction, one thinks about collision experiments, yeah, cross-sections, and colliders. Uh, okay, so the S-matrix, that's a quantum object. It might be a good, good object to describe interactions. Yeah? Unfortunately, usually it's much too complicated to, to be manageable. 
although there is this one class of models uh, where the situation is nice, it's in two space-time dimensions, where the S matrix is simple enough, namely factorizing, no particle production, so special for two dimensions, such that you can really take it as an input yeah, and solve the inverse scattering problem. So that's a nice situation, but special and uh, particular to two dimensions, unfortunately. Yeah? So I will speak at the end of the talk briefly about this. So this uh, is work initiated by Schroer in a longer program and then carried out <coughs> by uh, myself in collaboration with Buchholz during my PhD. Yeah? <coughs> but um, the main part of the talk is going to be devoted to a different subject namely to the construction of field theories on, say, four-dimensional space-time, or dim dimension will not be very important, say, four-dimensional Minkowski space. And uh, the question is, what is a good, good way to implement the interaction? Yeah, that's our problem. As we heard in Roberto's talk, uh, in algebraic quantum field theory, well, one, one might think, OK, the objects we are interested in are algebras, yeah? nets of algebras. So that's a very complicated uh, object, but somehow a uh, good input for constructing such data might be of algebraic nature as well. Some inclusion of algebras, for example. And we heard that, uh, for example, for field theories on the circle, half sided modular inclusions are good initial data for starting the construction. Yeah? In this talk, I will focus on the construction of models on Minkowski space without conformal symmetry, but uh, in spirit similar to this, to this construction on the circle. <coughs> Oh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, some short preliminary slide, which is, uh, I think most of you, if not everybody, has seen this before, yeah? So in the following, wedge regions play a significant role, and that's not very complicated. It's just uh, this shaded region here, which I, of course, can draw only in two dimensions, yeah? Extends to, the, to infinity on the right, uh, if you like formulas, it's just given by this inequality here, uh, x1 strictly larger than the absolute value of x0 and translationally invariant in the remaining directions, uh, depending on the dimension of space-time. So this region I will call the right wedge. And in general, any Poincaré transform of that region I will call a wedge. Yeah, okay. And why do I want to consider such uh, wedges? Well, to give you a very rough motivation, <coughs> Well, first of all, these regions are big. Yeah, compare them to point-like localized objects to points. Yeah, they are huge, bigger, and the bigger you might think, roughly speaking, the easier to construct observers localized in them. Yeah, because the locality is really the uh, the important issue when you want to construct interacting theories. The the sharper localized, the more difficult it gets. And wedges are big, so it's comparatively easy to construct something in them. Yeah. But it's not only that they are big, they are also small in a certain sense, namely two such wedges you can space like separate. You know, they are not too big. You can at least two of them you can space like separate. <coughs> okay. So now uh, to the basic constructive idea. Um, yeah, well, the aim is of course to construct a net of, say, C-star algebras for Neumann algebras on Minkowski space, which satisfies all these properties we've heard many times before, like locality and covariance, isotony. So all these properties would just guarantee it's, it can be consistently interpreted as the observables of a relativistic quantum system. Yeah? So this is what we want to construct. And as I said already, it's a very difficult object. It's loads of algebras. Yeah? Each space-time uh, space region, one algebra. So that's complicated. Yeah? So we somehow have to reduce the degree of complexity if you want to construct this. <coughs> and it can be done. Yeah? And the message is, well, these complicated local nets can be constructed from just a single algebra, namely such a wedge algebra containing observables which we think about being localized in this region WR and an action of the Poincaré group. So how can this be done? <coughs> we consider some, say, C-star algebra. The topological properties won't be very uh, important in this talk. Yeah? So you can think about unital star algebra, if you like. Yeah? Uh, so some algebra like this B, with some automorphic action of the Poincaré group alpha on it, and a subalgebra A. And well, what do I mean by this data B? is like the algebra of all local observers, yeah? some global object, or s uh, just uh, B of H of uh, some representation space, if you like. 
the subalgebra A is supposed to describe all the observers localized in this wedge. And OK, alpha, this action of the Poincare group, is just the relativistic symmetry, which you have on the big algebra. Huh? So if this interpretation should hold, two things must be satisfied, two conditions, which I call the isotony and locality condition. Yeah, familiar. So first of all, assume I have some Poincare transformation, so a shift x and a Lorentz transformation lambda, such that this right wedge is shifted inside itself. Yeah? Well, in that case, if A is localized in the wedge, it must be transformed inside itself. Yeah? We have no other choice. Yeah? So this is the first condition we must satisfy. Otherwise, the interpretation of being localized in the wedge won't be possible. And on the other hand, if you have a Poincare transformation which uh, grabs this right wedge and transform, uh, transforms it into the causal complement, then Einstein causality tells us, well, the algebra in the wedge must be transformed into something in the commutant. Yeah? So that's our second condition. Yeah? And for short, I will call such a system, such an inclusion of algebras and such a Poincare action on the bigger one, a wedge algebra. Yeah? That's our initial data. And OK, I, I motivated that these are necessary conditions. Um, for, for A being localized in the right wedge, but it's also sufficient. Namely, if you consider this map, yeah, you, you take this tran Poincare transformed wedge and map it to the Poincare transformed algebra. And if these two conditions hold, then this is a well defined isotonous local covariant net of, in this case, C star algebras. Yeah? So that's already uh, quite a bit. Yeah? I mean, su such, a, such a big net we can construct from a single algebra, say one inclusion. Yeah? <coughs> okay, these are all the observers localized in wedge-like regions. If we want to extend to smaller regions, we can take intersections. Yeah? Just define the algebra of a region which is an intersection of a family of wedges to be the intersection of the corresponding algebras. Yeah? This extends all these properties also to this extended net with a problem that such algebras might be small because they are defined as intersections. Yeah? I will mention this problem in the end. <coughs> So now the constructive task is the following. Given the wedge algebra, satisfying these two properties, isotony and locality, and you might think of this as, as being given by an interaction-free theory, then the task is construct a new wedge algebra, so a new inclusion, maybe new uh, uh, action of the Poincare group, such that the two conditions are still satisfied, and that we can generate a new net. And this new net should be interacting, so we can do scattering theory, and we hope to find a S matrix which is not the identity, but some non-trivial interaction going on. Yeah? So that's the constructive problem in uh, this approach. Yeah? And well, one might have many different or no ideas how to do this. Yeah? Here we want to be a bit more uh, specific and well, start from something which we think of a free system and do some kind of perturbation theory. Yeah? We want to continuously deform such a wedge algebra with a deformation parameter, setting it to zero is the old, old system, and li uh, making larger and larger goes to some interacting situation. Yeah? So it's some kind of perturbation theory for wedge algebra, what we are aiming at. And well, for concreteness, just think of this B as, well, think of A as being represented on some Hilbert space, and then B just take B of H, all bounded operator on the Hilbert space. And alpha just uh, think of being uh, unitarily implemented on, on the Hilbert space by unitaries. Yeah. Then, uh, well, having once again hardware scattering theory in mind, uh, you see that you are allowed to keep alpha fixed, yeah, because you may think of working on, say, the incoming particle states, and there we know, well, the representation of the Poincare group does not change. Yeah? It's, it's uh, the same again as on Fox space. So we will keep this alpha fixed, but deform this inclusion. That's what we want to do. Um, yeah, before I uh, start to describe this in more detail, let me give you a very short overview of, your, of the development of these particular kind of uh, deformations. Yeah? It started uh, in a joint work with Harald Grosse, yeah? where our motivation was quite different. Namely, we considered a free field theory on Minkowski space, so as simple as it gets, and wanted to understand uh, how can we put this free field theory on Minkowski space on a non-commutative Minkowski space. Yeah? So you might have heard of non-commutative Minkowski space, yeah? non-commuting coordinates. 
And well, we found a certain way how to do this using just CCR techniques, uh, annihilation creation operators. <coughs> This was then uh, generalized tremendously by Buchholz and Summers. Yeah? They, uh, well, they found a procedure called warped convolutions. I will explain in the uh, uh, well, in five or six slides, yeah? which can be applied not only to a free theory, but to any net. Yeah? Or well, just a deformation procedure for certain operators, yeah? which gives the same effect for these free field theories that we had discussed before. So this is in an operator algebraic language. And they were uh, uh, also able to prove that these two consistent con conditions I mentioned are stable under this deformation. That's the important point. Yeah? Afterwards, uh, Harald and I reconsidered the subject and uh, looked at the particular case of Whiteman quantum field theories. Yeah? So we, he we heard yesterday in Jacob's talk about the Borchers algebra and representations of that with respect to Whiteman state. This was the setting we were considering, and we, we saw this uh, warped convolutions of Buchholz and Summers they can be understood as the effect of introducing a new product on the borchardt ullmann algebra. Yeah. Um, and now, well, now we are in more or less a final status of this deformation, I hope, yeah, where we merge the two points, the two last points. Yeah? So we want an operator algebraic uh, understanding of what's going on, and moreover, uh, we discover that this can be understood by introducing a new product, not on the borchardt ullmann algebra, but on some C-star algebra, of this C-star algebra B I mentioned. Yeah? So this is a connection between these two points of view. We introduce a new product uh, in the abstract setting, which is uh, a known procedure called refill deformations. I will review it. And then uh, we obtain these, uh, these uh, earlier works of Buchholz summers the warp convolutions. Yeah? So this is a work in progress. Yeah? There are many unpolished points still available, uh, still around, yeah? but the main message, I, I think, is already clear. Yeah? OK. Uh, first, I need to explain what these refill deform deformations are and then apply to the case of deformations of wedge algebras. <coughs> so, refill deformations is a general deformation procedure for C star algebras introduced by refill, obviously. That's why the name, yeah. <coughs> was designed uh, with quantization in mind, yeah, as a generalization of wire quantization. And the setting is as follows you consider a C star algebra with a strongly continuous automorphic action. I call it beta, I guess, yeah, of the translations. <coughs> and you pick as a deformation parameter just some anti-symmetric re real d times d matrix. And then you introduce a new product. Yeah? The C star algebra has a product, but you introduce a new product depending on this parameter theta by this integral formula. Yeah? So you shift your A and B with your action and integrate against this Fourier kernel here. And, well, it's clear that this integral does not converge uh, absolutely or in any nice sense because it's just constant and norm, yeah, the integrand. Yeah? But it can be defined in an oscillatory sense if uh, the dependence of the integrand on these uh, p and x is smooth. Yeah? And this can be achieved by going to a smooth, dense subalgebra of b. Yeah? Then you can give nice meaning to this integ integral and in the end just just uh, calculate with it as if it was a usual integral. Yeah? You have to check all these steps, but usually you can, you can treat it as an ordinary integral. And well, a point I would like to stress is that this product was designed to deform commutative C star algebras. I mean, uh, observable algebras of a classical system to observable algebras of a quantum system, non commutative ones. But in its general form, done by Riefel, it can also be applied to non commutative B in the beginning. Yeah? That's what we want to do. Just uh, some properties of the product I would like to recall. Oh, but my microphone, well, works. <coughs> so here, the formula for the product again. What do we know? Some main results are, well, first of all, if you take the deformation parameter to zero, it's the old product, not very exciting. Then for any choice of deformation parameter, it's an associative product on this smooth subalgebra. Yeah, the star operation works as uh, before. If you have an identity, it stays an identity. Beta is still an automorphic action also with respect to the new product. And in the end, you can complete this deformed smooth algebra to a deformed C star algebra by finding some appropriate deformed uh, C star norm on it. Yeah. 
Okay, this will not, so, uh, not be so important in this talk. For application to quantum field theory, um, I also want to briefly mention something about states and representations of this deformed algebra. Yeah, so we have a procedure. Riefel tells us we take one C star algebra and get a new one, yeah? depending on this parameter. And because we have a new product, this also introduces a new positive cone. Yeah? Squares are different. Yeah? In the old algebra, squares of this type are positive operators, B star B. With the new one, B star B, but with respect to the new product. And this is uh, usually a very different notion of positivity. Yeah? The consequence is, if you have a state, a positive functional on B on the old algebra, it's usually not positive on the new algebra. Yeah? I mean, it's just a different notion of positivity which you need. <coughs> and OK, that's a problem. Yeah? If you have, have a nice state on your old system, say a vacuum state or whatever, it maybe is not a state at all on the new system. Yeah? A recent result in this context is, however, that any state you have on the old algebra can be deformed to a new state, which is positive again, on the new one. Yeah? A new result of the Freiburg group here, Kaschek, Neumeyer, Waldmann. But we won't need it, because we consider a simpler situation. We consider the simpler situation where we only look at translationally invariant states, invariant under this action beta. Yeah, this is physically well motivated. I mean, think of vacuum states or thermal equilibrium states. These are translationally invariant. It's a simple case, but a relevant case. Yeah? And the good thing is, in this case, you don't need to change the state. Yeah? Or put differently, let uh, omega be an invariant state on your undeformed algebra and introduce a GNS data yeah? corresponding to that state. And uh, U is Oh, my pointer, oh, it works, yeah. Uh, these unitaries U of X are the ones implementing the action on the Hilbert space, on the GNS space, yeah. Then, first of all, <coughs> the first message is it stays a state on the deformed algebra because it just does not see the deformed product. Whenever you take a deformed product, a new product times B, and evaluate an omega, it's the same as taking the old product, yeah. This you can compute using the translation invariance of omega. OK, and uh, the GNS triple uh, of the deformed algebra is closely related to the old one. The Hilbert space, OK, this is obvious from here, does not change. Yeah? The implementing vector does also not change. But what we are interested in is how does the new representation of the deformed algebra act on the undeformed one? Yeah? So we consider such combinations, deformed guy acting on an undeformed guy on the invariant vector. Well, you get the new product. And you just write it out in terms of the unitaries implementing the action. Yeah? So that's your formula, how the deformed operators act on this GNS space. Yeah? In particular, you see, if you, uh, if you drop the B here, or say put B equal to the identity, yeah? then you see ah, the deformed operators directly on the invariant state, you, don't, you do not see the deformation, yeah? because the identity stays an identity. OK. So this was our formula uh, for, for the um, uh, deformed representation, let's say. And now in this setting, we can forget about the abstract C star algebra, and we can forget about the representation, and just work concretely on the Hilbert space if we like. Yeah? So we just consider this integral formula and uh, ask ourselves, well, does it make sense for which kind of operators f on our GNS space and which kind of vectors psi in our GNS space? And just, uh, just as before with the Riefel technology, you see, well, if f is a smooth operator, bounded or can also be unbounded in a certain fashion, and psi is in the smooth domain of this representation, then it works as before. Yeah? That's your deformation formula. And now to make contact with the warp convolutions of Buchholz and Summers, well, first uh, remind, uh, recall that this u, yeah, it's. Uh, strongly continuous representation because the action was strongly continuous and it's unitary. Yeah? <coughs> so you have some spe spectral measure, joint spectral measure of these uh, four or five or depending on dimension uh, how many uh, translation operators you have. Yeah? So you have some joint spectral measure. If you insert this in this place here for the, for the shift u of x, well, you get such a formula and Carrying out the integration over, over x gives you a delta function, and you end up with this uh, shorter-looking integral. Yeah? 
which if you see it without the line before, is not so clear how to understand it. Yeah, I mean, you can read, uh, you can read it as a definition of this, or you can uh, do an independent definition of these warp convolution integrals, as has been done by Buholt Summers. Yeah, but in this setting, it turns out that they are really equivalent. Yeah. Yeah, one important effect of this uh, state, so why, I mean, I could work in the abstract setting all the time, yeah? but wh why do I choose a state and go to a representation? The important effect is here uh, the spectral measure, integration over the spectral measure extends only over the spectrum, of course. Yeah? That's how it is defined, so we have the spectrum everywhere here. Yeah? Here we only integrate over S. And because of the delta function, it also means the p integration is only over the spectrum. Yeah? That's important uh, to have in mind. Um, yeah, okay. So, I mean, the spectrum can, can of, uh, of course, have well, various shapes depending on the, cha on the state you choose. Yeah? You may think of vacuum states where it's in a cone or of equilibrium states where it's the full space, so there you do not gain anything. Yeah? But Depending on the state you choose, uh, you get a different domain of integration here. Um, okay, now let's apply this uh, refill technology to the deformations of wedge algebras. And uh, remember, our task is we have a given wedge algebra and want to deform it to a new one. Yeah? So the old one, I just uh, recall the two conditions we had, yeah? the isotony and locality conditions, these two. Okay, this we assume we have, yeah? It's our interaction-free system, if you like, or any quantum field theory which we can handle. Yeah? So how to, de how to apply Riefel's, uh, Riefel's deformation procedure? Well, B is already called B, so I take this C star algebra to deform it, yeah? No problem with that. I need an action of uh, RD, yeah? Of the translations on the big algebra, but I have it. I even have a, an action of the Poincaré group, yeah? So I just can take the restriction to the translations, yeah? so there I can do my deformation. <coughs> I uh, don't have an action of the translation on the small algebra A, because usually it's not left invariant on the translations. Yeah? I mean, you can shift outside the wedge, yeah? so it's not invariant. Yeah? But what you can do to uh, come up with a deformed wedge algebra, which I denote A theta, is you just take products, so with this refill type uh, products, of elements in the smooth algebra, A, yeah, and generate a, a, a new deformed wedge algebra like that. Yeah? So that's the definition of the deformed wedge algebra. Yeah? Okay, these two conditions upstairs, uh, they involve Lorentz transformations. Yeah? It's important to control Lorentz transformations because we need to go to the causal complement yeah? and we need to rotate and so on for covariant theory. So we somehow need to understand uh, what's the relation of Lorentz transformations uh, to these Riefel type products. Yeah? But this is an easy computation. Yeah? You just uh, look at such a new product, A Riefel times B, yeah, and act with a Poincaré transformation. So I told you already the translations uh, are still automorphic. They act on each factor only. But the Lorentz transformations are not. Yeah? They also act on this matrix theta in the middle. Yeah? But you can easily compute that. Yeah? So that's the structure of the action of the Lorentz group on, <coughs> on the deformed system. Yeah? And if we now are to satisfy the first condition, for the deformed system, yeah, where we have all these refill products, well, then we, and, yeah, we have these refill products and they, they will be deformed by these Lorentz transformations up there. Yeah? So we, say we need to choose the theta in such a way that it is not, not uh, that it's invariant under all Lorentz transformations which map the wedge inside the wedge. Yeah? If you can achieve that, then we are in a good situation for the first condition. Yeah? So, how can this be done? <coughs> well, it's a matter of choosing, uh, choosing the right matrix theta. Yeah? That's a simple lemma. Yeah? You have to compute a bit. Yeah? First, you have to ask yourself, what are the Lorentz transformations fixing the wedge? Yeah? There are not th that many. You have a boost in the x1 direction, this fixes the wedge, and you have rotations in the edge. Yeah? And that's it. Maybe some reflection, but let's stay in the identity component. Yeah? And then, uh, well, you look at this this action here of the Lorentz group on the matrices, 
and you have to find a matrix with the same stabilizer group, but with respect to this different action. Okay, and it can be done. Yeah, in the most interesting four-dimensional case, it looks like this. I mean, here you explicitly see in the upper corner, this is the boost invariant part for the x1 direction, and this is the rotation invariant part for rotations in the two, three plane. Yeah? And okay, if uh, the dimension is higher than four, you have a big rotation group in the edge, and so you have to choose a trivial here, otherwise it won't work. Yeah? Okay, but given this choice of uh, theta, where these kappa and kappa prime are still free parameters, you can show that whenever you have a Lorentz transformation, mapping the wedge inside the wedge, uh, it sometimes works, sometimes not, oh yeah, it's precisely the same as preserving this particular matrix. Yeah? And whenever you have a Lorentz transformation mapping the wedge into the causal complement, it's precisely the same as mapping this matrix theta onto minus theta. Yeah. Okay, so the first point tells us, let's pick a theta as described above, then the isotony pro condition is no problem for the deformed system. That's satisfied, yeah? by choice of theta. And the second problem, uh, the locality condition, is related to this point, where we see uh, the, the causal complement corresponds to, the, to minus the deformation parameter. Yeah? So for, uh, for this locality condition, we need to consider expressions like that. Yeah? We have minus theta products and plus theta products and one way or the other. Yeah? This should be zero for all C. Yeah? That's the condition. And uh, you have to be a bit careful here about the brackets because every such product is associative, but they don't mix uh, under each other. Yeah? So here you have to, play, you have to pay attention how to, how to place the brackets, yeah? just like that. Yeah? So this uh, should be zero for any C if A is in the right wedge and B is in the left wedge. That's a condition, this locality condition. Yeah? And okay, we just compute what it is yeah? using Riefel's formula. And well, it's a bit of computation, but not very difficult. And you end up with this uh, formula, yeah? this difference, this twisted commutator, if you like, is once again such an oscillatory integral. And here you have inside a commutator with respect to the undeformed product, just the usual old product, with uh, shifted A's and B's, yeah? and then shifted once again outside, okay, and applied to some shifted C. Important to notice is you can express it in terms of an undeformed commutator. Yeah? And the condition, of course, is if this undeformed commutator for all values P vanishes, well, then you have your locality condition. That's what you want. Yeah. But uh, usually, well, this will not be zero for any choice of P, yeah, because, well, this is just shifting in arbitrary directions. Why, why should they commute? Yeah? You can shift in the wrong direction. So they, in general, will not commute. <coughs> Only for very particular theta, for theta to zero, for example. Yeah? <laughs> okay, that's why we go in a representation. Yeah? That's why we pick a nice state. So let's write the same formula down once again, but now in the GNS representation with respect to a translationally invariant state. Just the same formula again, yeah? but only in the con on the concrete Hilbert space setting. And here, remember, the effect is the P integration extends only over the spectrum corresponding to the state. Yeah? That's the important point. So we need to control less conditions. Yeah? We only need to control that this undeformed commutator is zero for all p in the spectrum, yeah? which might be a, a much weaker condition than the abstract one. Yeah? And okay, this is also what uh, Buchholz Summer saw in their warp convolution uh, business, and they, they discovered, well, if this kappa, this, this parameter kappa appearing in this matrix, if you choose it positive, yeah? and if you have a vacuum state, well, then uh, first in a vacuum state, yeah, your spectrum is in the forward light cone. Yeah? And if you uh, choose the theta with this positive parameter, well, then this forward light cone is mapped by, <coughs> by the action of this matrix into the right wedge. Yeah, that's the important part. So if you have some A localized in the right wedge, you shift in the same direction again, so you stay in the right wedge. Yeah, and if you have a B localized in the left wedge, you just get the opposite translation. Yeah, so they are shifted apart, 
uh, I mean, they are even better causally separated than before. Yeah? So they will commute also in the deformed system. Yeah? So for this choice of the matrix, we, we really get a deformed wedge algebra. I mean, a new system uh, satisfying the two conditions yeah? in this particular vacuum representation. So here uh, I'm cheating a bit um, because, well, what is the problem? You can end up with unbounded operators in this business. Yeah? I mean, you always have, uh, have to take care that this product is first of all, all only defined on the smooth subalgebra. And this Riefel extended C star algebra is really different from the old C star algebra. They have dense intersection, yeah, but, well, they can, uh, if you take products between two arbitrary elements of the undeformed and the deformed algebra, this might not be defined. Yeah? So you can end up with unbounded operators and a lot of technical work has to be done to overcome this. Yeah? But I won't talk about it here. <coughs> uh, just uh, mention some of the properties uh, of the deformed system. I mean, now, now uh, the constructive part is over. Yeah? We have the new wedge algebra and now we want to, want to see, yeah, well, what have we constructed in the end? Yeah? We want to extract some, some properties now. And okay, the first idea is of course to do scattering theory. Yeah? Maybe we have nice cross-sections or something really describing an interacting system. And okay, if you have a decent energy momentum spectrum, you can really do, uh, you can do Hargrohe scattering theory as before. For this, it's uh, important to use two properties. First of all, you need the Dresch leader property. Yeah, and here, well, remember on the, on the vacuum, you don't see the effect of the interaction. Yeah? So you still have Dresch leader for all these wedge algebras, so that's no problem. And well, then you just apply the scattering theory, which was also developed for wedge local operators in this joint paper, Borchers, Buchholz, and Schroer, 2001, where you effectively use the two wedges can be space-like separated. Yeah? So two particle scattering can be described in this setting. Two to two particle scattering. Yeah? And then you can compute what are the S matrix elements here in an idealized fashion with sharp momenta P, Q, outgoing, P prime, Q prime, ingoing in the deformed setting and compared to the same S matrix element in the undeformed setting. Well, there's a simple relation, but uh, they are not the same. Yeah, that's, uh, that's the message. Yeah, they differ by a phase factor. Yeah, so in particular, if you have a free S matrix before, you have a non-trivial S matrix after the deformation. Yeah? You have these additional phase factors. It's not a very strong kind of interaction, we agree. Yeah? So it's, I mean, it's only a phase factor. Yeah? So when you think about experiments, how to really observe this, one usually says, yeah, time delay. So two, you have no particle creation. Yeah? Yeah, an observable effect. observable effect. Observe that this uh, new area, because of this choice of theta, the theory is not fully local. Yeah? Because otherwise, we know it must be Lorentz invariant. I will come to this in a minute. Now, uh, well, so this uh, somehow ends uh, the Riefel story a bit. Yeah, I mean, we saw a general procedure given one wedge algebra, how to obtain a new one and extract its properties. Yeah? Some change in interaction, yeah? at least in the two, on the two particle level. Uh, now I want to speak about a related but somewhat different deformation procedure, other examples of deformations, which uh, works with this borchers ullmann algebra, which Jakob mentioned yesterday. Yeah? So this, we, we had the definition yesterday, yeah? the tensor algebra over the Schwarz space of test functions on your Minkowski space. Yeah. So that's not C star, that's uh, LF, I guess, is called this kind of algebra. Yeah. But uh, never mind. <coughs> what we now need as an input uh, for our deformation is some function. So we, a function on the upper half plane satisfying a number of conditions. I'm not very precise here, yeah? So you need analyticity conditions, analyticity in the open upper half plane, for example, and certain symmetry conditions, very similar to what uh, Roberto had in his talk, yeah? But slightly stronger, I guess. <laughs> Maybe we should discuss this, yeah? It's not identical, but it's uh, slightly stronger. Yeah? Moreover, this is on the half plane on, and not on the strip, but you can transform, yeah? That's no problem. So this is uh, one input, you need this function. And the second input, uh, as before, your matrix as deformation parameter. Yeah? So theta somehow tells you strengths of the interaction and R kind of interaction. Yeah? 
So with these two data, we introduce a new tensor product on the borges ullmann algebra by the following formula. So the tilde is Fourier transform. Yeah? It's easier to write down in Fourier space. So I take some two elements of, the, of this S, yeah, multiply with a new product, take the nth component and evaluate at n momenta. And well, up to here, it's the old product. Yeah? This is the old product. And the new part is uh, these deforming factors which you have here. Yeah? Loads of factors of this R and the theta is uh, also in the argument. Yeah? So, well, that's first of all a new product and some properties we might check. First of all, does it work well together with the star and with the identity? Yeah? Is it still a star algebra with the old star uh, and unitil? And yes, it is if you pick R appropriately. Yeah? I mean, here you can read off conditions on R. Yeah? And in particular for this first one, I guess I need this R, this minus one. Yeah? So, so that's maybe, maybe different to your setting. Yeah? So this star condition, uh, well, also gives you a condition on the function such that it works. Yeah? And if you take this function uh, e to the i argument, yeah, then you end up with a Riefel deformation as before. Yeah? Because here, then, the products, you get just sums in the exponential, and you well, end up only with shifts of these two functions. Yeah? So then it's uh, the same as before. OK. So uh, up to now, similar to uh, the Riefel deformation construction, there we now chose a state uh, in the Riefel setting, some translationally invariant and particular vacuum state. So here uh, we do something similar. We also pick a state, but even much more particular. Namely, we pick the Whiteman state corresponding to the free massive sc uh, scalar field. Yeah? Um, and then, well, if you take this particular Whiteman state, you can show once again it does not see the deformation in the product. Yeah? Once again, uh, if you take a new product or an old product, it's the same evaluated in this state. Yeah? That's particular for this special state. I mean, yeah, here you see already all these products. You somehow have to use this quasi-free structure of, this, uh, of these endpoint functions of the free field, and then it works out that they all vanish yeah, for a single product. OK. So, but with this choice of state, we have the same structure as before. Yeah? We once again have a state which does not see uh, the deformed product. So we can go to a representation on the same undeformed Hilbert space and only get deformed field operators in this case. Yeah? Um, OK, and I don't want to talk about many details here, but well, the structure is very similar. You have deformed field operators on the old Hilbert space, generate, for example, polynomial algebras, localized in wedges. And you once again might check, well, uh, so by construction, uh, it's still isotonous, but the, the question is about locality once again. Yeah? Do they commute the wedges which are causally separated? And this is where analytic property of R come into play. Yeah? So, and this is all once again similar to this uh, S matrix business. Yeah? And well, then you have your uh, deformed wedge system again, okay, satisfies all your properties, and you might once again check what are uh, the features of the deformed uh, quantum field theory. And you can once again compute S matrix elements. Yeah, remember here in the Riefel setting they had such a form, and by comparison, he here you now uh, find this function R. Yeah? This appears here as. Uh, as two particle S matrix. Yeah? So, in a way, you put in the two particle S matrix to solve this. Okay. Um, a more problematic point local observables. Yeah? So, up to now, I told you starting from a wedge algebra uh, which defines a net, yeah? you deform it in such a way that you can still construct a net from that yeah? with all properties you like. A net of wedge algebras. And there's also this very general feature how to extend it to, say, double cones or any compact region, yeah? just by intersection. <coughs> but because, well, you do intersections, it's a problem uh, to ensure a large size of these intersections. Yeah? It might happen that they are small. Yeah? So this is a problem to be addressed. And, OK. Yeah, yeah. I mean, refill is a special case of what I'm saying here. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, well, I, I will come to this in a second. Yeah? Uh, so if uh, space-time uh, dimension is larger than two, huh, then we saw uh, you have a, Lorentz, uh, a breaking of Lorentz symmetry in the S-matrix. So you know it cannot be a fully local quantum field theory. Yeah? This is not possible. 
And this indicates that at least the Riesz Lieder property for double cones is violated, yeah, for any of these deformations. And well, I, I think uh, I learned that uh, Buchholz and Steve, you have a proof that they are even trivial, the intersections, yeah, so <coughs> even stronger. And for this Riefel case, yeah, for the others, not, not clear, but maybe similar. <coughs> so this indicates, well, we still have striking non-local feature in the construction. Yeah? We, we can go to wedge algebras, intersections, well, then we, we somehow see that uh, the S matrix we get is too simple for four dimensions. Yeah? I think you can put it like that. And what we need is a more general type of deformation to overcome this. Yeah? This is what we are looking for, what we want to find. Yeah? You want to find an interaction which is so strong, I mean, you need particle creation and everything, and also on the two-particle level that uh, this um, small size of, of the intersections can be overcome. Yeah? So you need more general deformations. Yeah? But the, stra the strategy can proceed in this direction once again. I also want to say something about the two-dimensional case, which is special, because here, well, in two dimensions, you only have one uh, anti-symmetric matrix up to rescaling. Yeah? So there's no choice if you, if you choose uh, an anti-symmetric matrix. And uh, the Lorentz symmetry is not broken. I mean, the Lorentz group is very small in two dimensions, admittedly. Yeah? But it's not broken. <coughs> and there is an infinite family of these functions R, which are used for the deformation, such that the deform local knot net still satisfy the riesz lieder property. Yeah? And actually can be identified with certain integrable models with a factorizing S matrix involving R on the two particle level. Yeah? So this uh, shows you in two dimensions the program can be carried through to the very end. Yeah? You really end up with, say, Singe Gordon model, for example, can be constructed like that. Yeah? And it's a very different well, point of view on this construction. I mean, you don't need Euclidean methods and well, it's uh, well, yeah, very complementary to other construction techniques. And there are a lot of models which we con can construct in this way, but not uh, with other methods. Yeah? So this just to make some advertisement for the method. Yeah? <laughs> um, OK, I think I'm almost done. Let me just conclude with a couple of short remarks. So first, I hope I have convinced you that these deformations of wedge algebras, they provide a new perspective of the problem of constructing interacting quantum field theories. Yeah. I mean, it's a kind of deformation procedure. And well, different deformation procedures are, uh, of course, possible. I, I think Stefan will also talk about some deformation procedure tomorrow, but in a perturba perturbative setting. Yeah, this is a particular one adapted to this wedge local situation. The best studied example is in four dimensions. Uh, and it is closely connected to refill deformations uh, with an invariant state and leads to wedge local theories with a non-trivial S matrix, uh, which is already something. So as an outlook, well, what's going on as well <coughs> in the field from now? First, we would like to apply these techniques to, others, to other states, maybe for special algebras, but to other states, and or curved space times, special curved space time. Yeah, this, Eric Morfa Morales is working on that. Um, there are, ah, well, this I should have erased because uh, if at first I thought I would not include the Borchers algebra case, but I told you already. Yeah, so <laughs> this uh, I've spoken about. And the last part is once again a relation to this non commutative space time business. Um, with the refill deformations, I mean, you don't need much as an input, just an action of the translations. Yeah, and it if you have, say, Minkowski space, it's not necessary that you take what you would think are the natural translations on this Minkowski space. Just any action of the translation group will do. Yeah? I mean, automorphic and continuous and so on. Yeah? But with these techniques, um, the <coughs> Stefan Waldmann, also in collaboration with Dorothea Barnes and other people in Freiburg, they developed some model of locally non-commutative space time, yeah? uh, which was up to now, uh, well, more a deformation of a Cartesian product of the space time. Yeah? You deform around the diagonal in the product. Yeah? And it was not so clear how to put a quantum field theory on that, because it's not really a deformation of the space time, but a deformation of a product of the space time with itself. Yeah? It was not so clear how to work that out. But uh, now we saw, and this is a joint product with Stefan, uh, that uh, using the Borchers algebra, uh, 
you, you, can, you can easily apply this uh, refill business with this funny, compactly supported uh, action of the translations and end up with something uh, like a quantum field theory on a locally non-commutative space-time, yeah? where, where you have just some region in space-time which is non-commutative, and apart from that, it looks as before. Yeah? And we are investigating what the features of this theory are, are but it's well, way too early to tell, uh, tell anything about that. Some problems have to be overcome. So, and I think I close here a couple of minutes before time. Thanks for your attention. <coughs> Yeah. Return to the yes. Uh, what was the reason? Why is this not possible directly in the refill or in the spatial uh, I'm still I'm still trying to do it on a C star algebraic level, but it's uh, I mean, well, let's go back to this definition. I mean, basically the problem is so if you have an exponential function here, you get sums in the exponent, yeah. So it depends only on really the overall momentum, yeah. yeah? And here it depends on individual momenta, yeah? And it's not so clear how to generalize this to a C star setting. I mean, it's not just an action of the translations, it's more, yeah, more detail. Yeah. In the spatial picture, you have the, the spectrum which is just additive. Uh, yeah, and you just have, well, so to speak, uh, translations in the center of mass, yeah? Yeah, and that's different here, yeah? Like a part of the form group yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, a mathematical problem when you when you see at these uh, when you look at these refill deformations. Yeah, you have a group action. So why take RD? Take any group. Yeah, that's what you would like to do. But it's complicated when the group is not abelian. Yeah, um, there are some partial results uh, on this translation dilation group. Yeah, which is a bit non-abelian only, yeah. There are similar formulas <coughs> exist, but for the general case, for example, for rotation group, not at all, yeah. Well, there is a sort of bulk calculus for the rotation group. By, I think that, that was a paper by Garcia, Bondi, and Marini. Uh, mm. They haven't considered this from the C-star algebraic point of view, mm. but at least we know what the calculus is going to be. So. Uh, maybe it's, uh, so I don't know this, yeah. Maybe it would be good to look at, but so from what I heard, uh, from people working with refill deformations. Well, the general idea is, we well, have here the formula. So this uh, exponential, you have to change if you take a different group. Yeah? And well, you, these integrals are defined in a funny way. Yeah? You have to be very careful that it really makes sense at all. Yeah? So it would be great. Yeah? I mean, I if you could do it for the Lorentz group, you would be very happy. But uh huh. Uh huh. Okay, yeah, well, maybe you can tell me a reference later. Huh? <coughs> Could you go back to this previous slide that we have to just a second? Um, where was that? Uh, this product. Yeah. Uh, if I recall this correctly, in the lethal uh, deformation case, this is the S matrix that comes up. This is one of these factors. Yeah. Yeah. So the modification of the S matrix. So uh, could you, I mean, does it make sense to take any of the integrable S matrix, S matrices uh, that are now in three dimensions and just ensure it also because then also get a new product? Yeah, I mean, uh, so not any, yeah, but well, if you don't have bound states, for example, no poles, but for the simplest case, it works. It's just uh, the conditions which I need, yeah. And, uh, direct check. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's how I found it because of my previous work on factorizing S matrices. Yeah. <coughs> More questions, yeah? Yes. I would like to know what, what type of uh, when you say non trivial S matrix in the D equal 4 case, yeah. what type of non trivial? For example, does it preserve the number of particles or can you have production amplitudes? No, well, first of all, we can only compute 2 to 2 particle scattering because of the size of the wedge. Yeah? And there's no uh, production process involved at all. It's well, just these 
Well, it's uh, as in uh, integrable field theories. Yeah. So yeah. So no production. No. No. I mean uh, preservation of the particle momenta. Yeah. And you you cannot, uh, for example, maybe this was uh, just to reestablish the historical truths concerning uh, constructive the theories when mm. mentioned that. In the 70s and the 80s, there was based on the Lagrangian formalism this uh, huge school of constructive field theory. Yeah. Balaban, sure, so sure, yeah. To produce non trivial S metrics, but in two and three dimensions. Like yeah, formal. yeah. But, uh, and non factorizable S metrics. Yeah, there seems to be a little overlap as far as uh, the models are concerned, which can be treated with the one or the other method. Yeah? I mean, <coughs> these P phi 2, for example, are very nice theories, definitely. Yeah? And, uh, no, it's, uh, first of all, I think they don't know the S matrix of that theory. Yeah? It must be very complicated. It involves production and everything. So when, when you think here about, well, putting maybe not a multiplication operator, because if you want to change momenta, yeah, maybe you uh, take some integral operators. You run into problems because you want associativity. Yeah? And it's uh, strange conditions on your integral kernels. Yeah? I'm not sure if it can be solved. Yeah? <coughs> Two particle scattering, so uh, there is no production in these two particle collisions. Yeah. Yeah, then this is following up on Jack Post. Uh huh. You have the Hamiltonian of your before theory because we have the time evolution and we have the representation of this invariant on Jack. Yeah. You know, well, the uh, time translations uh, are not deformed. They are the same as before. Yeah? So you have, if you start with three you have yeah. three Yes. I mean, here, I mean, that's maybe uh, quite different to your other approach. The Hamiltonian is the same as before. Nonetheless, we have interaction. Uh, how can this work? Yeah, because, I mean, the way you express uh, the Hamiltonians in local fields is very different. Yeah? I mean, we don't have control over local fields here. But I think just of any quantum field theory which you believe to be interacting, and then go to the, say, incoming particle space, you know, then your representation of the Poincare group, in, in particular the Hamiltonian, is the same as before. Yeah? So from this point of view. Sorry? It is the same as an operator, but not as a function. Really? Uh, true. Yeah, true. But can't you write it down explicitly and see? No, no, no. I mean, to write this down explicitly, we would need to have uh, these local fields. Yeah? And this strategy just relies on uh, circumventing this problem of constructing local fields, which we know is very difficult. Yeah? We go to this uh, wedge local situation. Yeah? There we can much easier construct and everything works. And the local stuff we just do algebraically by taking intersections. But the individual elements we don't control. Yeah? So uh, this is not a procedure for, say, computing a, a four-point function of an interacting theory, but rather a scattering matrix, yeah, which maybe in the end is more important. Yeah. <coughs> so, other more questions? Yeah. Well, returning to the uh, comment on constructive <coughs> theory, of course, if you have constructive models like the sign of the which yeah. is integral and yeah. matrix is known. So is there any hope of yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so what? Where you can compare, for example, Sinch Gordon, yeah, because it's nice, no bound states, yeah. So bound states we haven't treated here, yeah. Uh, and uh, in Sinch Gordon, well, it's the same S matrix, yeah. We cannot reproduce any Lagrangian from the net. How should we, yeah? But uh, well, it's the same S matrix, and so well, from this point of view, it's uh, the same theory. Yeah? But uh, I mean, otherwise. It's not clear how you could compare, yeah. <coughs> Are there more questions? So if not, we take the speaker again.